Commodore C64C, introduced in 1986 as a facelift to the earlier Breadbin model released in 1982, and as an attempt to bring the C64 on brand with the recently released Commodore 128 and paving the way for the Amiga 500. I never owned a C64, my own journey went from Spectrum to CPC to Atari ST to Amiga before finally falling to the dark side and PC ownership. This machine was advertised as Mint in Box and through a cheeky bid I managed to bag it for under £50. As usual, sold as untested so we can assume that it's not working and hopefully we'll be pleasantly surprised. It certainly looks alright, all the keys spring up and down and there's no obvious dings or scratches and certainly nothing that a good scrub won't sort out. But we're not the first owners and the machine has been open before. The case screws are missing and the warranty seal is broken. Hopefully there's no damage on the inside but the only way to be sure is to open her up and take a good look. It's worth checking the serial numbers as it's not unusual to find a mismatch set. Commodore tended to build these machines out of whatever they had lying around. With no case screws to bother with, it's a simple matter to unclip the front of the case to remove it. Being careful of course not to apply too much pressure and damage the side clips. Plastic this old can be brittle so it's good to take your time. Unclipping the LED from the mainboard will allow the top case to be removed and set aside and we can already see the cardboard RF shield. We'll be removing that as it's not really needed these days and can lead to excess heat building up in the case which is bad for the chips and can lead to premature failure. The keyboard is held in by two screws, one either side. You can tell roughly when your particular C64C was manufactured as models from 1987 onwards had all of the graphic symbols printed on top of the keys instead of on the side. This was purely a cost cutting measure but it's a good trick to see at a glance roughly how young a particular machine may be. With the screws removed we can lift out the keyboard. We can see from this side profile that there is practically no discoloration of the plastic keycaps so again we'll just give them a clean. We need to remove the keyboard cable from the mainboard and we can do this by moving the RF shield out of the way and giving a gentle tug. Don't worry too much about the wiring taped to the back of the keyboard, they came out of the factory that way. We can now remove the screws that hold the keyboard stands in place. They also hold the mainboard down and we can remove the other screws too. If you were to compare this mainboard to that of the earlier breadbin models, you'll see it's much narrower. Again, this was a cost-cutting exercise where Commodore integrated many of the chips on the earlier boards into more complex but fewer chips. This allowed the board to be smaller and therefore cheaper. These boards are known as the short boards. It was about this time in the disassembly that I noticed something major missing from the board. Something that meant this machine, as delivered, would never have worked. Have you spotted it? Don't worry if not, all will be explained later. And with all of the mainboard screws out, we can simply remove the mainboard itself. That RF shield won't go to waste, I'm sure we can find a home for it somewhere. The colour of the inside of the case matches the outside, so definitely no retro bright needed on this machine. So let's take a little tour.
Two serial numbers, neither match the case, good old Commodore. And remember when I said there was something major missing? Well, no fuse. So with our disassembly complete, let's take stock. Apart from a bit of dirt to clean up and a missing fuse, we seem to be in good shape. We'll need to replace the capacitors for good measure, along with a new power supply of course, can't trust the old ones. We'll put some heat sinks on the chips to help prolong their life. And of course, we'll replace those missing case screws. So to finish this session, let's get the recap underway. And off we go. With a fresh set of capacitors from phil at retroleum.co.uk, there's a link in the description, we can give the old girl some much needed love. Some of these capacitors were difficult to remove as the amount of copper in the rails on the mainboard dissipate the heat very quickly. I had to set my soldering iron to 400 degrees Celsius flow plenty of fresh solder into the joints and then wiggle and heat, wiggle and heat with a desoldering pump to get the little suckers out. Luckily the new ones were much easier to go in with fresh solder and plenty of flux. With all the capacitors replaced, it's time to give the board a clean with isopropyl alcohol and some anti-static brushes to get the flux and general grime off. So we'll leave her there for now. In the next episode, we'll pop on those heat sinks, slap in a new fuse and test to see if all is well. If so, we'll get the case cleaned up and put it all back together good as new. If you like my channel, please subscribe and hit the like button so you can be notified of new content. I look forward to reading your comments. Goodbye for now.